All right. So um, first of all, thank you so much to Brett and Jenna for inviting me to um, join you all today. I it's a real honor to be in such a, amidst such a brain trust of people who care so deeply about sagebrush country and sage grouse. Um, I am a newcomer to the sagebrush and have fallen deeply, deeply in love with it and feel personally that um, it's in need of a PR firm. We need more people to know about what's going on in sagebrush country and to care deeply about it. Um, and I think one way that I can contribute to that is through storytelling. And that's kind of what I've devoted my career to and trying to engage people with the natural world and science and um, these thorny, wicked problems that we face like climate change, like cheatgrass. Um, and so sage grouse, when I moved to rural Washington became a very clear vehicle to explore um, some of these larger themes around our um, lack of connection with nature and um, our divisions within our own country right now. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about my journey as a journalist, how I ended up in sagebrush country, and then I'm also going to share some, some thoughts about communicating about science and sage grouse um, and these natural resource issues in the sixth mass extinction. Um, and a little bit about, I'll share some thoughts about the media landscape in this country as I think it relates to sagebrush country and why it's undercovered and these issues um, that are deserving of more attention are not getting it. Um, and then, but first a little bit about um, why I made a podcast about sage grouse. <laughs> I've had so many editors and people ask me, wait, what, sage grouse? Really? You're gonna do an eight part series about a bird that most people will never see and many people in cities where I come from, you know, the East Coast have never even heard of or thought very much about. Um, so in this present group, we all care very deeply and think a lot about these birds, but for many people, sagebrush country is a vast expanse of land that you drive through on your way to the coast when you move west or on your way to visit grandparents that you don't get to see very often who live still in rural America but the younger generations you know are moving to the city maybe that'll change with the pandemic but to be to be seen um ultimately the this podcast is a love letter to a bird that i think is deserving of a lot of love and at the very least wonder and awe as many of you um you know it was, it was funny looking at the faces lighting up when uh when <laughs> someone was playing the sage grouse um, sounds earlier. It's, as an audio journalist, it's one of the most magical and important recording experiences I've ever had in my career. And one that I could not wait to share with listeners. Sorry about that dinging. I'm not sure how to stop that. Um, so here we go. Um, oh, and first note, uh, I was listening to Jeff's talk earlier about wildfires and um, was looking at the map and I am right, I live right on the edge of the black, big black spot that eliminated about 50% of sage grouse habitat in Washington state. So it was about a 40 minute drive for me to go and meet up with Michael Schroeder, who was one of the key scientists in this series um, to help explore uh, what's happening to sage grouse and why we should care and more about him in a minute. So this is me and my horse pistol um, riding in the Methow Valley on the Buck Mountain Trail. If anybody's been up to this part of the world, um, it is a beautiful, magical place, and I feel very lucky to be here. And I think many of what I love about this valley, if you don't know the Methow, is it has a real mix of, you know, fourth generation, fifth generation ranchers that are still trying to make a living here, combined with um, more transplants. Um, it's not unlike Joseph, Oregon, I would say, is kind of a comparison and enterprise and those areas around around there where there's still some some ranchers and thriving ranching community. And when I moved out here, it was really important to me to be a part of that community and try to um, assimilate uh, as much as possible as opposed to kind of bringing my city background to bear on the landscape. So I grew up around horses and, um, but hadn't ridden in years. And I connected with a woman here in the Valley uh, who was a horse trainer and farrier. And um, she had this little mare pistol who's an Arabian and a pain in the ass and um, you know, partially trained. So I got her for free and she and I have been kind of figuring it out together. Um, but I have to say, I, I mentioned Pistol a lot in the podcast because she um, carried me on her back through one of the most um, challenging and interesting life transitions that I've had yet. And um, also opened doors in the community. So I joined the Backcountry Horsemen and started doing a lot of trail work and meeting people who really knew this country uh, and cared deeply about it um, right when I moved here. And I also started volunteering to move cows for local ranchers, um, which, you know, I use the term like help very loosely <laughs> in terms of how much use I might've actually been, but it was a sincere effort to learn about a way of life that I think um, many people don't understand and haven't taken the time to really um, explore or ask questions about with a sincere interest in 
learning as opposed to judging or going vegetarian and then looking down their noses. So um, observing kind of, you know, part of why I left the city of Seattle. I was there for seven years covering the environment for um, KUOW, the leading NPR station there. And um, covering the environment is a really, it's a hard, it's a hard beat. Um, science, the environment, natural resources, these are very thorny issues that people care deeply about, but they also are very quick to tune out because they can often feel hopeless um, or distant from people's lives. So um, I think after 10 years of doing it, I also felt like, um, well, first a little bit about the hopelessness. Here's just some thoughts that are in the first episode of the podcast. But the truth was, after I filed a story, if I heard myself on the radio while driving home, glaciers in the North Cascades have shrunk by 50% since 1900. I'd turn it off. Oh boy, well, I'll tell you, Ashley, it's a lot worse than it was last. Is what we Ashley Ahern has the story of this little frog and its shrinking habitat. I didn't want to hear the news I was reporting. It was just so depressing and hopeless. No glaciers means warmer rivers, and that's bad news for salmon. And NPR was requiring that stories be shorter and shorter, so that meant I'd only have about three and a half minutes to explain some super complex problem. No one has ever seen a die-off as big as the one taking place on the West Coast now. Maybe get a few different perspectives on it. One's arm is hanging on by a single gnarled string of flesh. Tell people basically how screwed we are. The young orca appeared to have been dead for up to a week before she washed ashore. And then sign off. For NPR News, I'm Ashley Ahern in Seattle. It was a fight every day not to become numb. And then in 2016, everything changed. So um, I had a boss when I first started um, working, covering the environment who um, sat me down. I don't know if you folks know the show Living on Earth with Steve Kerwood. It's been on the air for like 20 years or something and he's still going and uh, taught me a lot when I was first cutting my teeth. and. One thing he said to me is, um, you know, war correspondents get to come home. And that's not to say, take, say anything about PTSD and the, the horrors that war correspondents experience in that work. When you cover the environment, however, it's everywhere. It's all around you and you see it everywhere you go. Um, and that knowledge of how we're affecting um, the environment, uh, it just, it doesn't leave you very easily. And I think for many folks who work in sagebrush country and do the work that you do, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I heard one scientist tell me it's it's like writing the obituary for a species or, or many species in an, in an environment um, that's struggling and changing before our very eyes. So in 2016, um, I burned out. I basically decided that um, two things. I wasn't getting the whole story. Um, living in a liberal echo chamber like Seattle, um, I was covering the environment from the wrong place, it increasingly felt. I was covering the environment among well-funded liberal environmental think tanks that have full-time staffers sending out press releases to journalists to cover their issues and their agendas. And I was not close enough to the people that were living on the land and dealing with these natural resource questions and issues firsthand on a daily basis with very little cash resources very often, um, but no lack of commitment and love for the landscape. So to me, it felt like there was an imbalance in the media coverage or landscape around environment issues in this part of the world. So um, my husband and I made the crazy decision to jump ship <laughs> and we moved to uh, 20 acres of sagebrush. And um, this is our little house. You can see uh, during wildfire season, the first summer we moved here, um, desperately out trying to clear sagebrush from the immediate vicinity of the house and have since replaced it with stucco siding and you know more metal and all that we do to try to keep ourselves safe in wildfire prone areas. But increasingly I started to realize that um, how intertwined uh, living closer to the land, our story is with that of this bird. And um, wildfire, as you've heard already this morning, is a big threat to this creature and um, is a big part of life, at least in the place where I live now. Um, and I wanted to, in making this show, weave together my personal experiences with this bird and the troubles it faces, because I do think that um, sometimes it's a tough sell. You know, I had a lot of editors when I was pitching this podcast series say, uh, we can't bite on this. We've had, we've tried for, I had a one, one editor say, I've tried for years to make the sage grouse story interesting to our readers and failed again and again and again. Good luck. 
we were not signing on for an eight part podcast series about this. And so I went into this story with a very sincere commitment to connecting the human stories with the bird story, um, because I think that's the only way we get other humans to connect to a bird that they don't understand or maybe will never see firsthand. So this is the rendezvous fire that burned uh, to within a quarter acre or a quarter mile, excuse me, of my house um, two summers ago, not this past summer, the summer before. Human caused, started right up the dirt road and just, I'd never seen a wildfire in sagebrush country up close. I know this is not news to many of you on this, this meeting, but um, my attempt to share how different wildfire is in sagebrush country with the broader listenership and broader public proved challenging because I think many editors that I was dealing with in New York or DC still refer to it as forest fire. <laughs> and I'm kind of out here like, no more rangeland is burning than forest. Like that's kind of a misnomer. We need to kind of rethink how we talk about this issue. Um, and then being able to talk about it firsthand through my experiences on the, uh, on the land um, brought it to life. And then, um, oh, here's, sorry. So here's, um, here's just a recording from the rendezvous fire before I move on. In late July of last year, a wildfire started on private property just up the dirt road from my house, and it tore through the sagebrush towards us. I drove my pickup truck up the road to see how bad things were, and there was this moment where I remember sitting in the driver's seat, looking out the window, and just watching the flames roll across the sagebrush hillside toward my house, and having to decide, am I a reporter right now? Do I go and try to gather information, talk to firefighters, or do I evacuate? Do I try to take care of myself and my husband? So I turned the pickup truck around and I rushed home. You never think you're gonna be asking yourself these questions as you watch smoke billow. It's really beautiful in this horrifying kind of way and I just feel really detached from all of it right now. And trying to think about what it is that I need in my life to take with me. So far it's my grandmother's portrait, photos of my grandfather from World War II, passports, my grandmother's pearls. Weirdly, I'm thinking about bringing my coffee maker with me because what else do you need to keep going in this world right now? It's purifying in a sort of horrifying way, having your whole life forcefully Mari Kondoed. But I wouldn't wish those decisions or that stress on anyone. So living through wildfire, I think, changed how I cover it as a journalist and um, gave me a much greater degree of um, sympathy and empathy for people who live in wildfire prone areas and the way the media kind of parachutes in and looks for these horror stories to bring back to city listeners. Um, yeah, it's, it's different now for me living here. Um, but the story of wildfire is an important one that we can't look away from. And that was really a sincere attempt in this, in this podcast to um, spend some time with that. And to do that, I traveled to um, Nevada and met some really wonderful folks working for the Nevada Department of Wildlife and learned about the cheatgrass issue there firsthand. Um, part of, I think, what you all, all are trying to do, which is God's work, frankly, is communicate this issue of invasive species and how that's affecting the fire cycle in sagebrush country. Um, it is a really, really difficult thing to unpack and explain. And I remember the first story I filed for NPR, um, it was <laughs> a real challenge. It felt like writing a haiku um, to try and explain the cycle and how, you know, more fire leads to more cheatgrass, leads to more fire, leads to more cheatgrass, and then the sagebrush can't come back. And explaining all of that in three minutes um, was, uh, was daunting to say the least. Um, but going to Nevada and just seeing firsthand what this means, you know, that we're losing an ecosystem. And um, this is where good science comes into play. And frankly, um, passionate scientists are the key to me being able to do my job. So I want to introduce you to um, Caleb McAdoo with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, he is such a dreamboat. I can't say enough good things about this man. Um, such a, just a lifelong um, resident of sagebrush country, passionate about that ecosystem, um, hunts in it, fishes in it, has close family ties to it, um, and is working for the state uh, as somebody who's trying to fight the cheatgrass invasion and preserve an ecosystem that he's cherished his whole life. And um, I, we were bumping along in the truck and um, as he was kind of taking me through the Martin fire and um, which was then the largest fire in, in Nevada state history. And I, I said, you know, you're, you remind me a little bit of um, a general who may is fighting this, this huge battle and you may, or this war and you may win a battle here and there. Um, but overall the war doesn't seem like it's going too well. And he actually got, choked up and he said that's exactly how I was explaining it to my wife the other day when she and I were talking about what I do and how I'm doing it and 
Um, I think what I wanted to do in interviewing Caleb was to bring the humanity and the, the psychological challenge of what you scientists and sagebrush um, aficionados and enthusiasts are up against, um, which is has an emotional component. And I think that as a storyteller, when you are able to share that with a journalist or somebody in the public, um, even if it's your kid's class that you give a talk to or your local, you know, community hall um, talk that you might be able to give, showing that vulnerability and that passion and that emotional layer is, is critical to telling a compelling story about what's going on here in sagebrush country, because I do think people need to know about it. Um, so one of the, I devoted a full episode to ranchers and ranching and the role of cattle and managing invasive cheatgrass potentially as one tool in that toolbox. Um, and also part of the problem, to be totally clear, cows, when they're not managed properly, as I say in the podcast, are, are, are a part of this problem and can degrade landscape for sage grouse. Um, but I wanted to tell stories of, of ranchers that I've met who are deeply um, committed to the health of their, their grazing lands, whether they're federally you know, leased lands or, or privately owned. Because um, I think that's a story worth telling. And so... Um, this is, this is Pistol. This is a man named Craig Bozel here in the Methow Valley. He's a fifth generation rancher um, and uh, was, has been kind enough to show me the ropes in terms of how to chase his cows around without doing too much damage. And this is Merrill Beeler. So I traveled to Ledore, Idaho. Um, some of you may know Merrill. He was on, in the state House of Representatives for a while, Republican um, from Ledore and uh, uh, a rancher goes back at least a couple generations there. And I spent time with Merrill because he is somebody who um, bridges the divide regularly, as many people in this group do. Um, he is really uh, committed to bridge building and finding ways to communicate with folks who may not um, agree with him or maybe even like cows very much. Um, and he invited me onto his ranch and we went out um, horseback riding and I put a wireless microphone on him, which I'm not sure if you can see in that photo, but he's all mic'd up. and riding along with this guy and just seeing firsthand, you know, he's noticing down to how many bites were taken out of each bunch grass plant as we're riding along the trail. And that, that depth of um, perception, um, deep observation and commitment to the land is something that I really wanted listeners to understand because I think that's also a story that hasn't been told um, in a way that reaches people who've already made up their minds, who are already eating beyond meat or whatever you call those burgers um, and don't have any use for cows ever again on the planet. Um, so that's another, uh, you know, kind of, I think, shortcoming in sagebrush communications is the ranchers and the voice of the ranchers and how that um, gets portrayed. So here's a, a clip from Merrill. Ranchers in this valley have chosen a different route from the Bundys, in part thanks to Merrill's example. He believes in a more collaborative approach to regulation that involves visiting with regulators in person, breaking bread together, talking about what they're seeing on the land and how it can be improved. If you value something, you're going to invest in it. Doesn't matter what it is. Do you value sagegrass? Yeah, I think I do. Do you value them as much as cows? Well, now you're talking to a rancher. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if you were actually, to, if you had to pick, you'd pick the sage grass. Really? Really? Yeah. Come on, I, you're blowing smoke. No. No, I mean, if it came right down to it, simply because, you know, uh, you make the journey one time. And uh, you don't want to do something that ruins it for generations to come. So um, bringing voices like that to the airwaves was really important to me. And, um, and Merrill was really patient and kind and sharing his perspective, but. I think that's an important one. Um, so ultimately this podcast was, is a love letter to a bird um, that I think is very much worth loving. And, um, but I, I don't have, I built the whole series around the culmination scene, which is in the um, red desert of Wyoming. This, this photo was taken in a, 
a blind in the Red Desert. We, we set up the blind the night before and snuck in before the birds were active the following morning and um, just were able to sit in the freezing cold. And as many of you I'm sure have had this experience, but it was a really um, important life-changing and life-affirming one for me in recording this podcast. I had my microphone sticking out from under the blind and it has one of those, you know, winged rats kind of, or we call them drowned rats to block the wind. And the birds were practically fighting with it. I mean, they didn't notice it really, but they were right next to it, you know, right in front of it doing their displays. And um, not that the males are paying attention to much of anything besides doing their stuff when they're out there, but um, watching these birds and sitting quietly and recording and reflecting on what this means that this ancient ancient dance is happening every year again and again in the same exact places. It reminded me of, um, I covered the Elwha Dam removal on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state. This is the largest dam removal in US history and I'm sure many of you have heard of it. And I heard stories um, that the salmon when the dam went in for years would come back to the base of the dam and, and bang their, their noses against it, trying to swim upstream. And I had this image sitting here watching these birds that they come back to these same places again and again, even as oil wells are going in nearby or um, fire has burned and, um, and they're kind of, I guess they don't win too many Darwin awards, but um, there's something really beautiful about that determination and uh, eternal nature of that. So here's a little video I shot from there. <laughs> I know that's not new for many of you, but um, being able to share that with listeners who never really heard of these birds before is one of my favorite things about this job. It's sharing the wonder and the, the joy of these creatures. And there is perhaps um, no better scientist that I've encountered yet, although I'm sure present company excluded, I haven't met you all, uh, than Michael Schroeder to help share that joy. He is one of those scientists where as a, as a science journalist who's spent a lot of time thinking about science communication and how scientists share their research, um, he's the radio gods shined down upon me when I found Michael Schroeder. Um, he is one of those uh, blessed creatures who has been doing this long enough and is close enough to retirement that he doesn't give a shit <laughs> and will say what needs to be said and um, doesn't shy away from his findings and the implications of those findings and the emotional layer that can come with those findings and what we're to make the sense making, what we do with that information. And Michael Schroeder, I visited with him three different times in the course of recording this podcast. And he took me out to this, um, it's called the Mary Jane Lack, Mary Jane Hill Lack, um, which was one of the largest lecks in Washington state, um, not too far from Bridgeport. And we went back. Um, I was literally writing the final episode of this podcast over Labor Day weekend, uh, thinking about how to wrap things up and, you know, was going to go back to the same, you know, use the tape from my previous visit when we went back in the spring and counted the lek and things were looking pretty good and, um, or at least holding steady, nothing's looking great, of course, but holding steady in Washington state. And I was going to end there. And then the fires break out over Labor Day weekend. And I called Michael and I went, he and I went out to the burn area. And um, I will just play this for you. I think I would feel a little bit more optimistic about the birds from this particular area if they weren't surrounded by nothing. But this was the largest lek in the county and uh, it's right in the middle of oblivion or Mordor as somebody referred to it from the uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Michael estimates this fire may have wiped out half of the remaining sage grouse in Washington state. Fire is a part of this landscape, he told me. But, but the reality is this country is not used to fires of this scale. And these birds who are restricted to fairly isolated populations are not able to deal with fires of this scale because the scale is so large, they don't have any other options. They don't have any other places to go. There's no recruits uh, to this population from adjacent populations because there aren't any adjacent populations. So um, I have to, you know, thank Michael publicly. Many of you probably know him um, for just sharing his heart and his um, sense of humor, but also his courage as a scientist who um, is relentless. I asked him, you know, he's approaching retirement and I said, well, are you going to retire now? And he said, I can't go out on a down note. I have to keep going. So 
I don't think he'll ever retire from monitoring and studying these birds. And um, even though it is, I know, incredibly emotionally taxing for him, um, as, as it is for many of you, I'm sure. Um, and I think I'll close by just saying that um, I get asked a lot where I find hope. And I have to say that, and I say this in the podcast, I, I don't have a lot of use for that term. Um, I choose the word courage instead these days. And when I say that, I mean courage to continue doing what you see is right and good in the world without the certain knowledge that you're going to solve the greater problem. And so I think when I look at the group assembled today, um, I have so much respect for what you're trying to do. And I wish that more people knew about it. And I wish that there were more ways to kind of, um, to kind of describe this process for folks in the um, past. Somebody's it's unmuted, really but anyway. um, uh, I wish that there were more ways that um, we can reach, I think, the broader public to learn about this. Um, and I will say, though, that if I do find hope anywhere, it is at the local level. It is in my small community. There are not sage grouse anymore, but there are so many people that care deeply about the landscape and are trying to find common ground, even if they disagree politically, um, are from different backgrounds, different religious beliefs, different whatever you want to call it. Um, sort of like what you've seen with the RFDA, um, when people really care about a place, they come together to protect it. And that can happen on the local level. And I think that is still happening in this country on the local level, even if we are largely dysfunctional on the federal level in many, many ways. Um, so I'll close there and just say a huge thank you to all of you for all of the work that you're doing and um, courage, courage to you all. Ashley, thank you. Um, I wanted to transition to our next session here, but I mean, first off, um, that was that was brilliant. That was great. I think when Jenna and I initially met Ashley, she she gave us that that whole bit about like she doesn't have a lot of use for the word hope anymore, but courage, yes. And I think we initially were like, okay, okay. well, then we were taking it all in and. It, it kind of resonated with like, we don't want a sugar-coated version of the world. Uh, we're all trying to work on stuff that's hard enough already. And so I wanted to say, Ashley, just thank you for a taking, taking the journey that you've been on and presenting through the Grouse podcast, um, the rich and challenging story that kind of really does underlie the, the bird and the places and the people that are connected to it. Um, I thought that was spot on and, and hopefully everybody else was moved by it. Um, and also the thank you for your perseverance, just like birds that have a high fidelity to an area being willing to persevere through people who told you, oh, we can't back the podcast or this is crazy or we don't know why you're talking about this bird. Um, so super appreciated. Uh,